welcome everybody to this week's History at Home. Today we're talking about Pine Street and the area around it. And that was once known as Montclair's Little Italy. Um, it is also one of Montclair's newest historic districts. And Helen and Donato will tell you a little bit more about that as we get into it. Our two presenters tonight or today are Helen Fallon and Donato DiGeronimo. Both of them are board members. And um, Helen uh, did not grow up in Montclair, but boy, is she is a wealth of information about Montclair at this point. So, and Donato did grow up in Montclair. And um, sometimes I begin to believe he's related to everybody in there Montclair. Uh, Donato is sort of going to give us the color commentary, the stories behind the stories as we talk about the program, as we go through the program today. Just a reminder that if you'd like to support the Montclair History Center, you can do it in any number of ways. You can do it on our website by clicking on the donate button. You can do it by sending a check to 108 Orange Road, Montclair, New Jersey, 07042. Uh, we accept Venmo and we accept Zelle. So, um, you know, donations are, are our lifeblood. And so we really do appreciate anything anybody can give us at any time of the year. Um, and thank you for all of you who have supported us in the past. It really means a lot to us. With that, I think I am gonna stop talking and just turn it right over to Helen and Donato. But um, so as James said, we're gonna talk today about Montclair's historic Little Italy, also um, referred to as the Pine Street Historic District. And um, our presentation is gonna cover primarily the years from the 1880s to 1930s, cover social history, architectural highlights, touch on some of the major impacts. And um, it's so fun to, for me to be presenting with Donato. As Jane mentioned, he is a Montclair native and cousin to hundreds, but um, even more significantly, he is the keeper, sharer and connector um, of so much of Montclair's Italian American history. Uh, first, we're gonna cover some um, Montclair 101 facts to help put this neighborhood into the context of overall town history. Well, we all know that um, the Lenny Lenape Native Americans moved through our area as they traveled to and from the shore each summer, but there's no um, evidence of a major long-term settlement in today's Montclair. <coughs> Then in the late 1600s, uh, British settlers, including the Crane family, who had traveled to Newark via Connecticut, left Newark and moved west to the foot of the mountain. That's where we are. Um, at Montclair is settled at the foot of the mountain. Around the same time, Dutch settlers from today's Bergen and Passaic counties were coming into the area. Um, the area south of today's uh, Watchung Avenue would become known as Crane Town and north of Watchung as Spear Town. So the first draw to Montclair was the mountain. First mountain is part of the Watchung Mountains. It's the first ridge west of the Hudson. And there are lots of great reasons to settle here. The views, healthy air, strategic lookout during battle, great drainage for your farm. In the 1700s and early 1800s, most of Crane Town and Spear Town were farmland. Crane Town would more quickly become a mix of commercial, residential, and industrial uses, while the Dutch of Spear Town would hang on to their farms for much longer. So despite the Crane Town, Spear Town local names, officially we were part of Newark and then Bloomfield. And from 1812 to 1868, we were called West Bloomfield. <clears throat> if the mountain was the first big draw to this area, the train was most certainly the next big draw. Um, it's the one that would start to mold Montclair into the railroad suburb that we recognize today. In 1856, train service from the Lackawanna Plaza near Bloomfield Avenue was introduced making the daily commute to New York City, Hoboken, and Jersey City quite easy. In 1873, the second train line brought service all the way to our long skinny town's northern neighborhoods. But in order to have the autonomy to establish that second train line, we seceded from West Bloomfield and became a separate township called Montclair in 1868. Now class dismissed, we're on to the rest of our presentation. Let's look at what was happening in the Pine Street neighborhood. I'm gonna just point out, can you see my cursor, Jane? Okay, I'm gonna assume you can. This is Glen Ridge Avenue. We can. Yeah, we can see it, yes. Um, this is um, Grove Street, Pine Bay, Baldwin. Here's the mm -hmm. rail track. And I'll talk about these circles in there. You can see a little water coursing through here. Um, so believe it or not, the water source known as Tony's Brook supported a number of mills in this part of town from the late 1600s to approximately um, the late 1800s. 
it, there was a sawmill, woolen, cotton, and paper mills. <clears throat> At the late 1880s, the power of the water had been diminished as the streams feeding it were diverted or impacted. Also, the state legislature, surprisingly, passed an anti-pollution act in 1887 to protect the streams, effectively closing any remaining mills here. So housing that had been built in the 1800s for mill workers near Tony's Brook and along Glenridge Avenue was being vacated as the mills closed, just as other waves of people were moving into Montclair. How convenient. Um, so, and you can see there's a lot of undeveloped land here um, north of Glenridge Avenue. Now, um, Andiamo, here come the Italians. Um, from 1880 to 1930, Montclair's population exploded as farmland was developed into housing for people drawn to our beautiful, healthful mountainside town. This chart demonstrates um, that the difference from 1880, we had about 5,000 people. By the 1930s, we had over 42,000. That's more than we have today. Um, so these people were eager to build big, beautiful homes that we still admire today here in town and to make their commute easy. But those big properties don't take care of themselves. So immigrants, including those coming from Ireland and Italy and African-Americans moving north in the Great Migration, came to the area to find employment as gardeners, nannies, housekeepers. Many of the Italian immigrants found homes in the Pine Street area, turning it into Montclair's Little Italy. Why were the Italians leaving Italy? What was happening there? Many Italian immigrants came to this country to escape difficult economic conditions, especially after 1860. Uh, when unification uh, was happening in, in that country from about 1861 to 1870. During that time, commercial agriculture and um, industrialization were increasing, resulting in many Italians losing access to the common farmland on which they had depended. Um, Southern Italy was especially hurt. Italians saw opportunities in the US in Montclair and just like other ethnicities, people traveled to the same place as their family members or paisans who had come before them. There are several villages in particular from which um, many Italians who found their way to Montclair come from. Aquilonia, La Cedonia, Calitri, Mercogliano, um, San Fele, and Tarami in Sicily. And lucky you if you've gotten to go back to see where your people come from, like this group visiting La Cedonia. From 1891 to 1915, more Italians entered the US than did immigrants from any other country, and many of them were from Southern Italy. Infrastructure was a new and exciting thing at this time, and those roads and sewers provided ready employment for the immigrants, African Americans arriving to Montclair. This is a photo of Italian laborers sewer pipes on Church Street. At first, housing for these recent transplants was primitive, tents and barracks on open land on Midland Avenue, near Bloomfield Avenue, where Italian and Irish workers lived together. The Irish um, tended to stay in that part of town. But the Italian workers and their families started moving into former mill housing in the Glenridge Avenue area that may have looked something like this wood frame structure that was pictured in John Nolan's 1909 report on Montclair. Nolan was an early landscape planner and urban planner. We'll see that Italians would go on to build new single and multifamily dwellings when they moved in and much <coughs> of the architecture remains. Here's a spoiler, the Italians usually opted for masonry over wood frame as you'll see. All these Italian immigrants pouring into the country, um, they were reviewed with ambivalence. They were country folk, they didn't speak English, and they had that olive complexion. We checked some local newspaper articles from the early 20th century that mentioned Italians. Um, this one is interesting because it gives a headcount from the 1910 census and a glimpse into how Italians were perceived. So this article was about an infant mortality study and how the Montclair Board of Health had commissioned a detailed analysis of the distribution of colored Italian and white populations of the town by wards. Uh, the genealogists among you who um, scour census data are probably not surprised that in 1910, Italians were not considered white. As you can see from the numbers, the total number of Italians um, on April 15, 1910 was about 2,100 or about 10% of the total population. That was a 160% increase over the 1905 census. And nearly three quarters of the Italians counted lived in the fourth ward. The article goes on to note that, quote, the colored population numbered 2,500 or approximately 12% of the total population, which was a 38% increase from the 1905 count. Only one third of those considered colored lived in the fourth ward. Their residences were much more evenly distributed throughout other wards. Um, you have to think that perhaps some of them lived in as household help in various wards. 
By the way, the figures for colored population included 16 Chinese and three Japanese individuals. Donato is going to tell us about a couple other interesting articles that we found. Uh, this I just found recently. It, it, it was an article in 1937 about a band formed in 1907 by the Italians, uh, Corpo Bendistico. Turns out my grandfather and his brother were in it, and I didn't know that either. So um, they, they had a rich tradition of uh, having bands in, in Italy. And uh, actually, my cousin Rocco, I spoke to him, and he's living in La Ceronia, and he's the maestro de musica there, so he teaches music. So he, he pointed out that most of these uh, uh, people in this band were from La Ceronia, so I guess that, that tradition comes. Uh, there's another article, and it turns out this is also a relative through marriage. <clears throat> Patrolman uh, George Cousins, whose real name was Cugini, he and uh, Rocco Cardalicchio were the first two uh, 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 Italian, uh, Italians on the police force. Uh, he changed his name to Cousins, and Rocco Cardalicchio changed his name to Cardell. I, I guess that was the trend in the time. Uh, but there was a, a, a labor dispute on the corner of Greenwood Avenue and Claremont Avenue on, on, on putting in sewer pipes. And I guess they're the international hot carriers, which I was later a member of, uh, going back into the 1960s, there was, a, they, they said in the, in the article that there were almost 300 people there protesting or picketing. And as a fight broke out and a patrolman cousins got hit in the head with a, a shovel. And the New York Times reported that as that he, he died there, but that didn't happen. But uh, I guess there were labor disputes because they, I, I guess, uh, it, mostly the, the work was being done by the Italians and the Irish and, and some from the, uh, the local, the, the township itself had, had workers. And I guess they were all fighting for that space. Uh, that's, that's okay, Helen. You can okay. Uh, and then we have one more. Um, the last article that we'll share is a snippet from an interview with Pasquale Palladino, a Bloomfield Avenue merchant. He was also in the band that Donato just told you about, by the way. Um, and he was, a yeah, so he was a founder of that band. Um, he's commenting on the plight of his recently arrived countrymen. He cites the sharp contrast the immigrants experience here in America, the mode of life, the work in which they must engage, the food, the homes, it's all strange to them. When a ditch digger is asked what he thinks of America, he commented, America for making money is unsurpassed. Here every morning they hurry to the city to business. No smile on their faces. They have time for naught else. At night they return, their brows knitted. In Italy, we went every morning to the fields just as the sunbeams kissed the clouds, mid song and laughter. And at twilight, uh, we return to the sound of mirth. The article ends by suggesting these immigrants would benefit from some assistance. Well, enter Minnie Lucy. Minnie Lucy was a nurse and a social worker brought to this community in 1915 through funding from the Women's Club of Upper Montclair. She was the director of the home department in the Baldwin Street School. This initiative was part of the reformist settlement movement to provide support services to the urban poor and European immigrants to Americanize them. The settlement movement was active in many places in the US. After a five month trial period was considered successful in the school building, um, she was hired directly by the Montclair Board of Ed, continuing to work out of the Baldwin Street School. She earned $100 a month. By all accounts, she was kind, enthusiastic, tactful, well-trusted by those who welcomed her into their homes and tenements and apartments, genuinely concerned for the well-being of those in the neighborhood, primarily Italian immigrants, but also a smaller percentage of African-Americans. She was born in Connecticut, grew up in today's Glen Ridge, educated in Brooklyn and California. She worked as a nurse in, quote, congested districts in Paris, London, and Dublin before coming to Montclair, where she worked for 16 years. In her obituary, Minnie Lucy was hailed as a pioneer in Americanization work. She's credited with establishing the Baldwin Street Community House, moving the program from the Baldwin Street School into its own building down the block in the old Slayback Mansion on the corner of Highland and Baldwin. Mr. Jackson, principal of the Baldwin Street School, described Minnie Lucy's role to improve the schools by improving the homes and social conditions which affect the health and welfare of the children of the neighborhood, which includes encouraging cleanliness and precautions against communicable diseases. In 1929, that old mansion was demolished and a new Baldwin Street Community House building was constructed in its place. It was renamed the Minnie Lucy House in 1932 after Miss Lucy's death um, at age 45. The Minnie Lucy House served the neighborhood community until the 60s. It was used by the Montclair Board of Ed until 1971, and then the Head Start program took it over. In 1981, the 
the Board of Ed was given permission by the state to sell it. Let's talk about some of the programs Minnie Lucy implemented. In addition to focusing on hygiene and disease prevention, she also introduced American customs and culture. Her programs entertained through movies, dances, plays, and music, and encouraged patriotism. These new Italian immigrants were primarily peasants who had lived in the country. We heard from the ditch digger a few slides ago how moving to the U.S. and living in more urban conditions was quite different in many ways. African Americans moving up from the South would also likely have come from areas much more rural than Montclair. Minnie Lucy had little mother's classes when she discovered that many little girls in the Baldwin Street School were responsible for the care of one or more babies at home while their mothers worked. First, she demonstrated with a life-size doll, then the girls brought their real babies to school. And Donato's gonna tell us a story about that. Well, I interviewed my Aunt Julia Ruccio. Uh, she was my grandmother's sister. She was Julie Sandora. Um, she was born in 1902. And, and in my interview in the 1990s with her, she, she told me that she had to borrow babies from her sisters to bring to, to, bring to class at Minnie Lucy and how proud she was of doing that. So it, was, it was very interesting to me. Yeah, it's fun that they had to borrow babies. Um, so Minnie Lucy also held classes for adult mothers, like how to keep the baby well and keep the baby growing, emphasizing health, wellness, and safety. We'll run through some photos here. Um, for some, we're not sure if they were in the school, the mansion, or in the new building, but we're, we'll just keep it going. Um, this is an opportunity class where they would teach trades or manual skills. I'm gonna let you just read those captions yourself. Love the kindergarten picture on the right. Um, we were lucky enough, the, the picture on the right here of the Mini Lucy Club from 1957, someone fortunately wrote a very detailed caption on the back, so I might as well let you know who these ladies are. They're the, um, they're the board members of the Mini A Lucy Club in 1957. So seated left to right, we have Mrs. Henry Frenari, who was the first VP, Mrs. Janet Zangrilli, the president, Mrs. Nicholas Luparella, the second vice president. Standing left to right, Mrs. Nicholas Antolino, the treasurer, and Mrs. Michael uh, Morangelli, the secretary. Now we'll dive into the architecture a bit by taking another look at the Mini Lucy House. The Mini Lucy House looks like an Italian villa is, and is one of the most decorative structures in the district. It's intended to reflect the Italian heritage of many of the residents. It's one of three key buildings in the Pine Street Historic District. In addition to Minnie Lucy, there are two others, um, the Baldwin Street School and Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church. A historic nomination report was prepared for the Pine Street neighborhood prior to the demolition of homes that would be caused by the Montclair Connection train activity in 2002. The nomination report provided a lot of the architectural information I'm sharing and it defines the time period of significance as 1880 to 1937, coinciding with the greatest amount of Italian immigration, um, residents and construction in the neighborhood. So here's the um, Pine Street Historic District map. So we have Glenridge Avenue here, here's Baldwin Street, here's Bay, here's Pine, here's the train track, okay? And here's um, Sherman and here's Grant, just to give you your bearings. This was listed, um, the Pine Street Historic District was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2000. Now we'll talk about the second key building um, in the district, the former Baldwin Street School at 15 Glenridge Avenue on the corner of Baldwin. Um, it was built in 1912 with a, uh, an addition in 1923. It's designed as many schools in town built at that time are in the neoclassical style. In 1932, it was renamed the George Washington School. There were many school buildings constructed in this general time period. Uh, this building was closed by the Board of Ed in 1957 and Mount Carmel um, operated a school there from approximately 1961 to 1971. And today it is the Glenmont Square condominiums. You can clearly see in this 1922 map how the, this is even the original school building where um, a little corner of it was, this is the town line between Montclair um, and Glenridge. So you can see that a corner was in Glenridge and now even more of it. 
um, in the Mini Lucy School was always um, or, uh, was always in Glen Ridge. I'm going to show you later um, a town line marker from about here. We'll see that a little bit later. The Our Lady of Mount Carmel Roman Catholic Church is is the third key building uh, in the district at 94 to 98 Pine Street. It's also the last major building constructed in the district. The church was with the attached rectory was built in 1937. The design reflects Romanesque and Italian Gothic architecture. It's got some really beautiful details like limestone details here, this big rose window, um, you know, this beautiful feature here. Um, and it was intended, the materials and the styles were intended to remind Italian residents of their churches in the old country. And Donato um, recently learned um, a little tidbit about the origin of the name. Um, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, uh, it's in Italian, it's Our Lady of Mount, Mount, Mount Carmine. And um, that was the church that was, uh, there was a church by the name of that, that same name at the, at the port in Naples where everybody was, you know, where most of the, the Italian immigrants were, were leaving you know, that port. And so when they came here, you'll see uh, up and down the East Coast, uh, a, a lot of churches by that name. There's one in Orange and the, the main, uh, big one in East Harlem and, and all over with, with, with that name. And, and it was really to commemorate uh, the last church that they saw when they were leaving, I guess, to give them good luck on their trip. Right. Safe passage. Yeah. Um, here in the, and this, um, I took another shot from this side so you can see that distinctive bell tower um, in the red <clears throat> pile. And um, this on this day, there was a big crowd. I think that it was a wedding going on there. Uh, with a little more history on the church, uh, residents of this neighborhood originally, <clears throat> excuse me, attended church at Immaculate Conception Roman Catholic Church on North Fullerton, uh, which was more closely associated with the Irish Catholics in town. In 1905, Immaculate Conception offered an Italian speaking mass and confession to the growing number of Italians, but the Italian community really wanted their own church in their own neighborhood. In 1907, the Diocese of Newark granted permission for the new parish and the first mass was held September 8, 1907 in a wooden church located just south of, present day, of, of the present Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church. In 1925, fundraising began to build a bigger church. Um, it was stalled by the depression but finally, by 1937, the church and attached rectory were built right next to the old wooden church. Um, the old convent remained on site until 1961. It, and it housed a nursery school where D Donato developed an early love for lentil soup. She's Not saying that she's saying that very sarcastically. <laughs> As the story goes, the Filipini nuns, uh, they lived on the second floor and the school had two rooms, uh, one large room and one small room on the first floor where I was there as a, in, in, well, nursery school, we called it then. I guess it's preschool now. Um, but I, it seemed like every day we had uh, lentil soup and a sandwich. And I couldn't look at a lentil until I was in my 50s. And, and I, I've been talking to it with other students uh, and they all felt the same way. But now I love them. But <laughs> Uh, one last note, this church and Immaculate Conception are now both part of St. Teresa of Calcutta Parish. Parish life and clubs figured prominently in neighborhood life, spiritually and socially, with many societies, clubs, and festivals. Um, this is a little bit of an article from 1899 talking about the, um, the first Our Lady of Mount Carmel feast, and they really use some vivid language. Um, so they talk about Bay Street being the local little Italy, a gay appearance decked out with, um, you know, colored lights, green and red, hucksters crying their wares, consisting of nuts, cakes, macaroni sticks, which we still don't know what macaroni sticks are, um, tambourines jingling and plinked, and the Italian National Band of Newark playing from the improvised bandstand. And this is the first St. Sebastian feast celebrated in 1926. Um, this picture is a real find, thank you Donato, because um, you see the old wooden church that served the parish from 1907 to 1937, and apparently there um, are not too many pictures of that old church. Some pictures of the St. Sebastian Festival, and Donato can explain um, what they are carrying through the streets. Well, they're carrying St. Sebastian, but uh, in 1936, uh, the two Stavala brothers and uh, one of the Locascio men, they hand carved uh, that uh, the cart that the, the, the saint is in, and they call that the Avada, and it's it's beautiful. I mean, they still use it today. Uh, this, the feast still goes on the last weekend of August uh, every year, 
and then they have their carnival at Grove Street uh, play uh, Cavity Field at Grove Street, Grove Street Playground. You should all attend. It's great. And this is a later, obviously, color picture of that. And did you want to talk about some of the clubs that are still active, Donato? Uh, yeah, there was a there was a lot of clubs over the years. Uh, so, some that were are no longer exist. The St. Rocco's uh, uh, and uh, the Lachedonia Club was no, no longer exists. But the St. Sebastian Club is still in existence, and this is their uh, right now. This is where they hold their meetings on on Glenridge Avenue. Uh, there's the San Vito Club uh, is uh, the, the people from Aquilonia, and they uh, they just became a sister city to to Montclair. Uh, and I have Aquilonia Way, which is now uh, where Grand Street and, and Pine Street uh, meet. Mm -hmm. um, they still hold their meetings there. Um, and and um, there's a now a St. Donato Club, uh, which, which picks up from where there, there was one very early on in the 19th century, I mean, the 20th century. And uh, now they, they have meetings. Most of their meetings are held uh, in, in the St. Sebastian Club now. They're the only ones left. It's but there were many, maker. many different organizations in, in, the, in this area. Cool. And here's some other pictures. And then what are what are they carrying for the um, Our Lady of Mount Carmel procession? Um, anything about that statue? Oh, that well, that's that's the statue from Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and that's that's in the church now. And the Holy Name Society is a is a uh, at, at the time it's a, I guess it was a men's uh, organization devoted to the church, and they did things around the church. We'll run through again. These are some great pictures that um, Donato has found, and we'll just run through these. You can see the captions Democratic Party Recreation Club. Looks like a lot of um, good times here. These guys are a little more serious. <laughs> they look serious. The Russo Post American Legion. Here's some ladies. Uh, the, this was a uh, uh, Many people here, you know, the Italians here, uh, don't remember the name Rose and Barbara Grecos. They were sisters. But Rose uh, wrote a play, and Rose uh, taught in the, in the schools, and she taught a lot of folk music. And uh, she was pretty well known in, in Montclair. She died fairly young. Hmm. So it looks like they performed at the World's Fair that says um, 1965, if you can't read that on the slide. Oops. Well, that was a blurry picture of the Lachedonia Club picnic. I, I, you know, my relatives aren't from Lachedonia. They're from a different part of Italy, but in the tiny little town that we also have a yearly picnic. So this, um, this was up at where, where we, was Kip's Castle down. Uh, uh -huh. up, yeah, so. And the Patterson Symphonic Band preparing to play um, at one of the feasts. Great picture. Uh, now we'll circle back and discuss more of the architectural character of the Pine Street Historic District. So in simplest terms, I hope to illustrate the three periods of architectural significance for buildings here. Um, in the late 1800s, old farmhouses, that's style number one. Uh, Pre-World War I up to around 1917, when the US entered World War I, multi-story structures with ornate masonry embellishments, um, such as florets and with elaborate roof lines. That'll be style number two. And then starting around 1918, still multi-story buildings, but um, you'll see primarily brick buildings relying more on patterned brickwork. And one of the things that's evident as you walk through this neighborhood is that the masonry buildings um, front directly on the street, creating a very urban streetscape in a concentration that is pretty unusual in Montclair. The Historic Preservation Commission stated, the Pine Street Historic District is significant architecturally as an intact working class neighborhood of single family dwellings, multi-unit commercial and residential structures and small scale neighborhood oriented commercial properties. The district displays the Italian immigrant's preference for and mastery of masonry construction and structures built primarily by and for Italian Americans. The neighborhood is also significant historically as a cohesive late 19th and early 20th century Italian American immigrant community whose social, cultural, and religious life was entwined and dominated by the key buildings in the neighborhood, which we just mentioned, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Roman Catholic Church, the Baldwin Street School, and the Minnie Lucy House. So first up is late 1800s farmhouse or vernacular style house. Vernacular means essentially a simple everyday house built in materials readily available at the time, also described as architecture without architects. On the left is 51 Glenridge Avenue built in around 1890. On the right is 17 Sherman Street built in the late 1800s. 
Sherman and Grant streets contain some of the oldest and smallest homes. And um, as Donato and I noticed when we walked through the neighborhood a few weeks ago, very few of them remain for a variety of reasons. And based on the fact that there's a porta potty blocking the front entrance um, to this property, we're thinking this house might not be long for this world. Moving on to the pre-World War I architecture from the late 1800s to around 1917, um, there are so many good examples. 41 Glenridge Avenue. Um, so the first, first of all, the first story is brownstone, most likely from a local quarry. The rock quarries were one of the things that First Mountain was good for. Um, you'll see a lot of cornices. That's like a defining line at a, maybe at the first story level and certainly at the roof. And a lot of detail, like these tiny little teeth, which are called dentals. Um, in, in fancy brackets, and th these windows have these or ornamental hoods on them. So um, it's interesting, an interesting zoning note is that although the area was largely residential, the entire neighborhood was zoned commercial. That was kind of uncommon to be zoned um, like that to this scale in Montclair, but it reflects the way this Italian American neighborhood lived with family life and commerce so closely connected. And Donato, did you wanna comment on this? Um, not right now, no. Okay. <laughs> and 43 Glenridge Avenue is in um, 1913, another residential and commercial structure. You know, these beautiful arch surrounds, um, this very detailed cornice at the roof line with these big brackets and these wonderful garlands. Um, and, and most of them have um, the fancy doorways with uh, sort of simulating uh, pillars here. And we really love this stylized 1913, which was the date this was built. Another one with the, uh, you know, with the fancy roof cornice line, the dentals, the reeds, these are keystones. Um, this is great how they have these fancy surrounds of the windows in this, um, the brick, different colored brick um, patterns. And of course they have the fancy front doorway. Uh, this is 29 to 31 Glenridge Avenue. It was built in 1913 and it still has the original transom but a modern door. And you can see some of the decorative work here. Um, and then uh, Donato is going to tell us about this one. Um, you're going to tell uh, us about this one. Yes, the, 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 on the top you can you can see very much the, right there. Yeah, there it is. And that that says Rosa Fusco, and uh, Donato Fusco was uh, the, the first contractor to build a, a building for the Italians here. It's on the corner of Bay and Glenridge Avenue. This that he extended. He was building. He continued down the Glenridge Avenue building these buildings, but this one has his wife's name on it. And I, I believe she had either 16 or 18 kids, I'm not sure, but they were prominent in town. Uh, um, but uh, apparently she she would look out her window or put a chair in front of the building to watch, to, to make sure the workers were doing the workers uh, correctly. So they put her name on top of it. So <laughs> pretty interesting. That was a thing, putting your name on it. Yeah. And um, here's 78 Pine Street, built around 1912. It's um, the red brick and the or very ornate um, hoods on the windows. Um, and of course, the lions on this building, really spectacular. Um, so to be clear, you know, other buildings in town certainly have architectural interest and may also have been built around the same time. But what's interesting about this neighborhood is how compact and dense it is, which makes the architectural trends of the various time periods um, easier to see and to um, to observe. Um, also, I know from the bus and walking tours that we've done that touch on this area that many people, some of whom grew up in other parts of Montclair, have never ventured to this neighborhood. Donato, can you imagine? They've never been to Nicolo's for a loaf of bread or a sub. And I just read today it was picked as one of the best. It's it by the People's Choice of one of the magazines. It's the best deli. It's very good and, and the best bakery, really. So yeah, if, if you haven't been there, you have to get there. Yep, yep. And I'm going to wrap up um, the pre World War One architecture with one of my favorite streetscapes. Um, this is on Pine Street, looking towards the church. So this is 108 Pine Street, and um, you know it's got the classic um, front door. It's got these uh, these are called coins. They accentuate the corners. Very. Uh, you know, elaborate roof line. It's got the tiny dentils. It's also got the, the bigger dentils are called modillions. And it's got these wreaths going on and all this fancy stuff over the windows. 
Um, let's see, do I have anything else to say about that one? And then 110 Pine Street is very similar, you know, with the coins and, but this one has a broken cornice, okay? So it doesn't go all the way across and it's got this cruciform in the middle. Obviously the front door has lost a little charm on this one, but you get the idea. And this was about 1916. So I suspect that you can immediately see a difference between this building um, than the ones I was just showing you. So this is our first example of the third style of architecture from about 1918 to 1930. This is 31 Grant Street. And it's all about the brick design and the ornamentation rather than um, elaborate uh, design details, but very interesting nonetheless. They're really into the stepped parapet in this era. So this roof line that goes steps around. The, and I, so this picture, you can see these two buildings right next to each other, but they still define like the corners. They have a different pattern of brick here. Um, and they're still um, accentuating the windows with um, different colored brick and a different brick pattern and with some other smaller, more discreet detailing. And they're, they're um, highlighting the front door with a brick pattern. And um, 57 Glenridge Avenue was built around 1927. This is a lighter brick, obviously, um, but again, with accentuating the windows with a different color, got the fancy surround on the front door. And then also they like to put the name on the building, which Donato has done a little research on. And we were looking for, for and it's Nicola, Nicola De, Denise. It has an E on the end. I don't know where the O came from, unless it was a mistake, or unless or that was his original name. But he was a local contractor. But he was also he and Pasquale Pasquale Palladino, who we talked about before, were were very early on, and even in the eighteen nineties, involved in uh, Italian politics in the area, and and also politics in Montclair. So they were uh, they were running for things even even in Montclair at that time. Very. 1890s, early 2000s. Um, I mean, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. I mixed it up. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, and then let's see, this is the um, 99 to 101 Pine Street, a huge building, um, but you can see the stepped parapet. I took some details, the definition of the windows, got the fancy um, front door. This used to have storefronts on it, but that have now been converted to residential, but there's even a little detail there. Um, and here we have 35 Glenridge Avenue. This was commercial down here, but obviously you can see that it's slightly different. It was changed to residential and they're accentuating the first floor, um, the, the corners at the roof line or at the first story line. It's interesting here because the bricks sort of lean out at a different angle. So when you're up close, you get a better appreciation for that. But, um, and then the different colored bricks running up through the columns here to sort of accentuate the height of the building and it's got the stepped parapet. And um, to wrap up the architectural section, I'll, I'll restate that there are three periods of architectural significance, and I suspect you can easily identify them now if you walk around the neighborhood. So um, first, the late 1800s, old farmhouses fit style number one. Pre-World War I up to around 1917, multi-story structures with ornate masonry embellishments and uh, elaborate roof details. And number three, starting around 1918, would be the um, brick buildings that relied more heavily on their brick work patterns than on sculptural additions. Um, now, although outside the time period of significance uh, that we're generally talking about in this um, presentation, we wanted to um, mention, um, to include a few developments that happened in more recent history that had significant impacts on the neighborhood. So um, I'm gonna, this is in 1963, a tax map, I'm gonna just orient you. This is Glenridge Avenue. And um, so this is Pine, um, here's Bay, this would be Baldwin. And um, so the entire south side of Glenridge Avenue, that would be this side. Um, the entire, okay, so the entire south side of Glenridge Avenue was gentrified at some point in the 1970s and um, early 1980s. And many of these small lots that we see on the map with many with, you can't read it, but many with the Italian names of the owners um, were wiped out um, for multifamily residential developments. And some of the lots are now empty. And also Cherry Street was eliminated at this time and um, Bay and Pine Streets were realigned. The Lackawanna Station was decommissioned in 1981 and replaced with a much smaller Bay Street stop slightly further east and Lackawanna Plaza was redeveloped into the you know, the grocery store, whatever, it's in the process of being redeveloped again. 
but um, many of the longtime Italian residents had moved to other neighborhoods by this time or out of town, and the area had suffered a decline as buildings were not kept up. Um, and the former social cohesion of the Italian community by this time in the 60s was not quite what it was. Um, but many who grew up in this neighborhood vividly remember the businesses and homes that once existed there. Um, here are some of the things that were demolished. Uh, can I say something here? Yeah, yeah. Sure. So I missed my cue before, but <laughs> what, we're, what we were talking about is, is this neighborhood was was pretty self sufficient. It, it had, I mean, all the grocery stores. Uh, 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 one in particular was Cohen's Jewish. It was, it was Cohen's Italian Deli, actually. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go to the uh, next one because we have his picture. Right, right, and and they also and uh, um, mix. Uh, they had a couple of chicken markets in in the area with with the live chickens. People still talk about that, how <laughs> the, the, their experience with that. There's Nick Sodas was one, and, and uh, there was another one on Pine Street. There was also three Italian bread bakeries during my growing up, and, and a Jewish bakery on Pine Street, Rosen's. The, the Italian bakeries were finest, uh, which uh, uh, the, the baker was Greek, uh, Monkler, a uh, Golden Crust, and then D'Alessandro's where, where, was where Nicola's bakery is now. Uh, so in 1957, I think, or 59, um, 57, I believe, at the Acme uh, was built on uh, on Claremont Avenue, and it was a it was a large grocery store. The CVS is there now, and that had an impact on on a lot of the smaller uh, uh, shops that were up up and down Glenridge Avenue and on Pine Street. That was the first impact, and then then gentrification started when they tore down. Uh, mostly the whole south side of that and Cherry Street was all part of a, a urban renewal that took uh, uh, took place on Bloomfield Avenue and and on Pine Street. I mean, on Glenridge Avenue. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to talk about the other pockets of like Italian neighborhoods? I mean, this one is a historic um, district, but did you want to mention that there were other pockets of yeah, Italian? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, Forest Street, um, Forest Street from uh, Claremont to the dead end on Forest uh, past Chestnut, that was heavily Italian, and that was that that was all, its own uh, little uh, enclave. And then uh, my family, we grew up in the South End, and. Uh, my family mostly grew up on, on Willowdale Avenue, which was just on uh, south of uh, Glenfield Park, and uh, that area uh, was was mixed mostly African American and Italian, and some Irish mostly. And in this very south end, there was also a, a, a number of Jewish uh, stores down there, delis and and uh, uh, candy stores, as we called them. Mm -hmm. uh, but they weren't uh, such an as an enclave like the Pine Street and Forest Street. Yeah, and those little those little enclaves were also other parts of town, like you know, around Laurel Place, whatever. So, you know, these little um, sort of the grocery stores, I guess, ran them all out of town. Um, but um, um, yeah. Okay. So the other oh wait, how did I? Um, oh no no no, sorry, lost my place. Oops, oops. Um, and we're, the next impact we're going to talk about is the Montclair Connection in 2002. Um, it, it joined two separate train lines that had existed blocks from each other in Montclair for more than 100 years, and they'd been talking for more than 80 years about combining them. Um, so they were joined right here in this neighborhood, and you'll see the mark that it left. But um, the Montclair line, which was originally a Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad that terminated at Lackawanna um, Plaza, ran just south of Glenridge Avenue. And um, the Boonton line, um, which was um, uh, which was the area originally the Erie line, ran just a few blocks north, and it, it went all the way to the northern um, tip of our long city town, as I mentioned. And so what they did was they connected them right here, um, and um, th this the line was renamed the Montclair Boonton line. Um, homes were raised the to do this, unfortunately. The line was electrified all the way up to Montclair State University to give commuters on um, a one seat ride to New York City. So this is, here's literally the connection on the left is seen from Glenridge Avenue, a new grade crossing. And it, um, and there it goes ripping through the neighborhood. Um, so you can see here it goes over Glenridge Avenue. This is all new. Here's Grant Street and Sherman Street used to go all the way from Pine to Bay, but now they're sort of little dead end loops. And you can see here's where it hooked up with the other train line. 
Um, in August 2000, uh, the Star Ledger noted that 33 families were displaced by the demolition, and um, some there were still some old time Italians living there th that were displaced. And I remember then Mayor Bob Russo telling me that he was getting calls from little old Italian grandmas whose homes were at risk, asking him if they should bother to put up the summer curtains. Um, and I kind of make light with that story, but it's really my opinion that this neighborhood has been subjected to more intense negative impacts than perhaps any other neighborhood in Montclair. Yet it has retained an architectural and um, cohesiveness that reflects its history. Here's some of the houses that were raised and Donato can tell us a little bit about some of the houses in this neighborhood that were um, demolished. Uh, I, I had the distinction of uh, actually, when I got on the fire department in 1978, my probationary year, we uh, Cherry Street was still there, and it was about to be uh, torn down. All the houses there, and I was uh, we trained on all of them. We we were cutting roof, cutting holes in the roofs, and doing. And it turns out one of them, a thirty Cherry Street, was my great grandfather's house where my grandmother grew up. Uh, and then in two thousand, when they were tearing the houses down for the Montclair connection. My other great grandmother was on 13 Grand Street, so I was a battalion chief at that time. So we trained on that house and we cut it all up. So uh, I wish I could go back and I have pictures of that one. I didn't have pictures of the first one. Yeah. No, sad. Interesting. In yeah, sad. You knocked it. It was all your fault, Donato. It was my fault. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then the last impact is um, is a major new residential development on Baldwin Street, just to bring up to speed, especially if you live out of town and have been driven through the neighborhood in the last few years. So this is a 120 plus unit uh, residential complex that was um, constructed on Baldwin Street in Glen Ridge across the street from the Minnie Lucy house and the baseball field. And it replaced older single family homes that were on very deep lots. And now we'll just um, finish up with some um, pictures and um, some oral history snips Great old picture, bad flood. We love this picture, it's Glen Ridge Avenue looking north um, up Bay. And so we dug into the oral histories that the Montclair History Center compiled a few years ago and wanted to share a few anecdotes. Uh, this first one is from Dr. Anthony uh, P. Cajano Jr. Uh, with memories of how his maternal grandmother collected coal from the train tracks, she put it in her apron. Um, so I'll let you read that for a second. And here's still Dr. Cajano Jr. explaining how a teacher at Montclair High School encouraged his grandfather to let his dad go on to a college education rather than drop out of school. And um, Dr. Cajano Sr. ultimately became a general practitioner in the neighborhood, but he didn't deliver all the babies in the neighborhood, right, Tanato? He did deliver me, but uh, I just spoke to his uh, to Dr. Cajano, the, the son, and uh, he, he told me his father delivered 7,000 babies, and he has delivered 7,300, I think, or 7,400 mm. in his lifetime. Wow. Uh, but the other the other prominent doctor in the area was Dr. Presta Filippo, who was uh, uh, an icon for the people from Chidami in Sicily. He did a lot. He actually uh, also built 55 Grove Street, the apartment built complex there. Mm -hmm. But he was an icon in, in, for the for the Cheddar Amazing. Nice. Some fun pictures. That's uh, Nick Zacchino and uh, Shorty Franchosi on the left. That's uh, Nicola uh, Bakery's father there. And the other picture is, that's Rocky Marciano. Uh, the two guys on the outside are the Ferraro uh, brothers, they had the auto uh, body uh, place on Orange Road that just got torn down is going to be built on next to the, the hotel. And uh, Charlie DeRosa <laughs> and um, Joe Beans Verbino. <laughs> there, so. This was a flag dedication ceremony during World War II, honoring the men of Italian extraction serving in the armed forces of the United States. Uh, on the right is uh, uh, from Nicolo's Bakery. That's his brother, Victor and, and Nick. They had a, a pizzeria. Uh, I think Nick started when he was like 17 years old on, uh, on Glen Ridge Avenue before he bought the bakery. Hmm. I want to say something about this. Okay. Helen and I were had to go back and forth and I was mistaken 
I thought this was a, this building was originally where Kajana Memorial uh, Funeral Home is, but apparently it was not. It was on cat, the caddy corner to that, kind of sitting where the uh, the Pathmark uh, uh, parking lot is. But this was the first Presbyterian uh, Italian Presbyterian church, and uh, that this building was built in 1905 and was there till the roughly 1928 when it was torn down and it got incorporated into Central Presbyterian uh, on uh, Park Street, the, the church with the, with the uh, clock tower. And uh, they also did a lot of Americanization, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bringing people in to teach people how to be a bit more Americanized. But yeah, you, don't, you don't hear much about Italian Presbyterian so much, but this was a pr fairly prominent. Mm -hmm. Nice waiting shots. Donato Crown. Um, here's some memories from Donato's aunt, um, Aunt Molly DiCarlo. She's 103 and still going strong. So. <laughs> um, Donato, tell us about the, the um, Christmas Eve pop -a fire This was a tragedy on uh, Christmas Eve, 1948. Um, this is a, a few doors down from the church. If you're looking at the, this house, the uh, Lady Montcalm Church is uh, like three doors down to the left. Uh, this is 106 uh, uh, Pine Street. And uh, an oil, I guess if you're being used for heat, an oil stove uh, that was being used for heat blew up. Uh, uh, the mother, Lucia, was uh, in, in the neighborhood picking up the, the toys for her kids to put under the tree. And uh, the father, Andrew, uh, was there with uh, two daughters and, and uh, two sons. And uh, the two sons uh, and, and one of the daughters died. And the other daughter was in critical condition, as was uh, the father. And they were in comas for a couple of weeks, but they survived. And uh, they, the family had another daughter after that. And uh, in 2006, when the mother died, Lucia, uh, the family uh, started a, a, a fund and or gave a fund to the fire department to, to, to do uh, education programs uh, about home safety, fire safety. Mm. Very, very sad. Very sad. And on a lighter note. For those of you who know, know Lou Monty, he's a pretty prestigious uh, songwriter. He was from Lyndhurst, but he married a... a Maria Cavello from Montclair and lived in the, this, this building on the corner of uh, Sherman and Pine Street. Well, coming down the home stretch, these were some pictures I pulled up the Italians of Montclair Facebook group. Um, just, you know, there's a lot of great stuff there. Oh, here's the town line marker I was telling you about on Baldwin Street. So um, you'll notice, so um, on one side it says ML, Montclair Line, and on the other side it actually says BL because Glen Ridge was still part of Bloomfield at that time. And um, we'll wrap it up with Joanne Bellis Diwali's memories of growing up in the Pine Street neighborhood. Um, first of all, note that um, the family changed their name from Flamia to Fleming. Uh, they owned a business and Americanizing your name was not uncommon as um, Donato mentioned. And um, her members, her relatives were also um, founding members of the band that we told you about earlier. And you can see that she finally remembers a wonderful, safe, and sheltered childhood. Um, she describes Pine Street as a bubble that you rarely left. And just love this picture of all the, um, a bunch of kids on Pine Street that really evokes what, um, what Joanne Bellostavalli was talking about. And um, so that wraps it up for, for us. We wanted to point out that um, there is an Italians of Montclair Facebook group if you're interested. And um, also um, to note that we appreciate the work of others who have shared the history of this neighborhood, including former police chief Thomas Russo, Frank Gidlewski, and Ruth Kunstetter. Um, there was a, um, an, an older Montclair Historical Society tour, and as well as posts on the Italians of Montclair Facebook group page. We also used many of the uh, resources from the Montclair History Center archives and the Montclair Public, local, Public Library Local History Collection. I want to say the chat was exploding. I tell you, oh. the, the noontime chatters are much chattier than the evening time <laughs> chatters are generally. Um, we had a lot of people who uh, talked about their connections to the area and to the families that are living there uh, back then. They recognized the houses that they lived in or their grandparents lived in. Um, Really, lots of fun. Lots of fun things went back and forth in the uh, in the chat. So I'm going to encourage 
Helen and Donato to read them as well. Okay. Um, but if anybody would like to share anything um, that you put in the chat, please do so. I think that in the interest of time, that would be fastest. I know it's one will stay on for another few minutes so that if anybody does have questions, you can answer, you can certainly ask them. So Shelly Panzarella is raising her hand. <laughs> My great grandfather, Michelangelo Papaleo, built one of those apartment buildings on Pine Street. Hmm. Was and I can't I wish I could remember the number, but um, my great grandparents lived there. My uh, grandmother's family was from Lachedonia. My grandfather emigrated from Kalitri. Yeah. And yes, and they married in Montclair. My grandmother was born in Montclair. Vincenza Papaleo Fastici. And I have been to those towns many times. I still have very close family on the Fastici side. We also had the cousins. Um, my grandfather was one of two of seven siblings that came to the U.S. But I remember many times going to Pine Street. My great grandfather made wine in the basement. He would always be sitting on the front porch on his little chair. And we would walk up and he would just go, mm, you know, later on, my dad grunted like that. All good memories, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And I don't know why my cousin Diane Papaleo Campbell did not get on this because she sent it to me on Facebook. Well, maybe get on at seven tonight. Right, she may join us at seven. So well, we have thank other you, gentlemen. Who, uh, grew up on Clover Hill Place. Uh, watched the Mount Carmel feast from my bed as I fell asleep. <laughs> Reminder as a young girl. I remember my aunt walking with the statue of Mary as I watched from my front porch. She was delivered by Dr. Caggiano and loved Nicola's bakery. Yes. Nick Soda's sort of granddaughter. Summarizes was on. the entire presentation right there, Jeanette. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Jane, yeah. I put a question in the chat, but it's a serious question. I just worded it kind of cute. So he mentioned that there were Jewish candy stores and Jewish bakeries in what is largely an Italian American neighborhood. So I said, does that mean Italian Americans were drinking egg creams? Because my husband is half <laughs> Italian. He had no idea what an egg cream was. And if the rest of you don't know, it's seltzer, chocolate syrup, and milk. That's it. No egg, no cream. And but I asked this question for the larger issue, and so many of you could answer this. How was the interplay? among the ethnic groups, especially Jews and Italians in um, that area of Montclair, because, you know, Bob and I get along just great because we know that food is love. Uh, the, the interplay, I, I grew up in the South End and um, the interplay between uh, the Italians at that time and, and the Jewish and, and the African-Americans, uh, I, you know, there was never really any problems that I, that I saw. You know, we 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 would frequent a lot of the stores uh, there, and, and everybody seemed to get along. Then, you know, um, it, it seems like once they went, left the area, looking backward, that they they had they had people talk about it uh, fondly, but also seems to have uh, brought up some racist things after they leave that seems more which is a shame to me but i think Somewhere. growing up uh, especially my family grew up on willowdale avenue and it was a great mix and i grew up in i grew up on on orange road uh, there was a one block that had 13 of my families uh, in like four houses on one block on, on orange road down the south end and it was a great place to grow up and we spent most of our days at nishwain park when we weren't in school so so. All right. I attended Glenfield School, and there were, you know, the kids who came over from Washington Street School and Minnie A. Lucy were Italians, and we were very close oh. at Glenfield. We were in the band together, and we went to the feast, and, you know, we had great times together. And yes, we did separate when we went to the high school, but we still remained friends. Thanks, Thank Nesta. you. I'm All right, everybody, spread the word. We're back on again tonight at seven o'clock. Um, 
And uh, thank you, Helen and Donato. That was lots of fun. I've walked that neighborhood a lot and as, as part of our tours and uh, the architecture really is a lot of fun. So if you have not been down there, make it a point to find some place. There's also a couple other restaurants down there to go for lunch and um, wander around and look up because I think you'll really enjoy some of the buildings down there. Uh, anything in closing, Helen or Donato? Uh, no, I think, um, I don't, Donato, I don't have anything. How about you? Where'd he go? Um, good. Thank you for, for coming, everybody. There, yes. but there's so much. And, and um, I'm the keeper of the Italians of Bunkler uh, group. Uh, if anybody wants to, to join to, to learn more stuff. So Great. that's on Facebook. Thank yeah, so we, had, we, we put in a lot of stuff and um, hopefully people also felt like they had um, time to get stuff in the chat or to, to ask questions, but we just couldn't control ourselves with all the great pictures. So thank you, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Ellen and Donato. See Bye. you tonight. Bye, Liz. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody.